Good afternoon, good morning. Today we have uh, the Senior Vice President of Lending, uh, Senior Vice President and Chief Lending Officer of Financial Partners Credit Union, Joe Brancucci, um, here with us today to really talk about financial partners approach and how they have been um, involved in the Bank On initiative. Um, they've been a part of the Bank On initiatives and one of our first credit union members to actually adopt and implement a Bank On um, account within their institution. And so we thought it'd be a really great idea to have Joe join us today to really talk to us about, you know, financial partners journey in this bank on mission, especially as we try to encourage so many of you all who are viewing this today um, to move towards that direction and, and offering um, a bank on account such that you have a, a, a affordable banking option for our under bank and our unbanked members of our field of membership. So with all that said, I'll turn it over to Joe. Joe, introduce yourself and let us know how long you've been here in the credit union industry and if you could share with us, you know, why are you passionate about or, you know, why Financial Partners is passionate about uh, this space. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I am Joe Brancucci. I've been in credit unions for a little over 30 years. I've been in banking for a little over 50 years. Um, credit unions to me are the, the, uh, the best financial solution for general population. They're not about profit. They're obviously about the members and, and what we can do to help them along their life's journey. And everything that we're going to talk about today are, are things that I think are the basis of that, that uh, long-term relationship. Um, I think we sometimes start in the middle of people's lives with what, what we offer them. And we forget about the fact that they have to start in that, in that continuum. Um, and uh, that is what credit unions have did. When you go back to the, you know, the early origins of credit unions, where we we created because there was a void in the marketplace, we weren't as our members weren't welcomed into the banking community, and I don't believe they're really welcomed into the banking community today. Um, they are just, um, you know, they're kind of cannibalized for those that they can make profit off of, but the rest of us that they not, may not fit into that category are kind of left out. And so, to me, everything we are doing now in our organization around developing these community relationships that allow us to communicate with a broader uh, segment of the marketplace allows us to help those folks on their journey and become members of this credit union. We become relevant to them in a different way than we would be getting an automobile loan or opening a checking account. And so it, it's really the way credit unions were formed and it's really back to the future a lot of, in a lot of senses by using the tools that are available today and the mechanisms in place that allow us to draw in a larger population of folks and help be relevant in their lives and help them along that journey, which is what we're all about. Right, Joe, and, it's, and I think you, you brought, up, brought up some really good points and that you know, really leads me to my first question. When we think about that foundation for you know, the underbanked and uh, unbanked population and welcome them, welcoming them into the credit unions, um, our credit unions, our member credit unions, what did that look like for you all? Could you tell us more so about, you know, what was that, what was you all's approach to implementing the bank on account or really joining the bank on movement? What was that journey like for you guys? How did you figure out how to get there? Okay, so, you know, we, we are a low, low income designated um, credit union. Interesting enough, about 82% of the loans we make are to in low, in a low designated area, in, in low income designated areas. But that wasn't really the, the driver. The driver was figuring out why we were, approach where we were had such a narrow segment of the marketplace being you know becoming members of this credit union and then why do we have such a large segment of that that group of members become the new members becoming members just having one product with us mm -hmm. and it's because really we were selling products you know it was price it was a media service it was a delivery channel but when we looked at it we we were we have a waterfall portfolio waterfall portfolio means i have a lot of a plus and a credits that's the easy loans to make. We don't have a lot of folks being drawn in. So why was that happening? It's happening because just the normal business uh, paradigm that we operate under is not attractive to those that are un and underbanked. They're mm -hmm. fearful of it. There's no real entry into it. There's yeah. no there's no real ability to have an affiliation with us where they can begin that trusting relationship. So we figured out what do we need to do to start creating a series of products mm -hmm. that were part of a bigger plan that would allow that new member to first feel comfortable coming into us and at the same time help provide discipline for them so they would get you know good financial habits and then be able to go into our mainstream product line and so that really was the basis of the bank on product um, mm. it's um, we, we figured we had two places we needed to start folks off we needed folks to begin in a 
to, to be able to establish a way of managing their money, but with a discipline around it, which with our bank on credit card, with our bank on checking account actually does. And then the second time, the second part of that was to start helping them build credit. And so we had two initiatives that, that were, um, we, we started out with. One was the bank on um, uh, checking account, which we call easy, the easy card. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we had a tweet, we actually had to tweak the, a checking account we actually had created for students. Um, that was a was the easy card, but we tweaked it and, and removed some things that were not appropriate for the bank on certification. And we are one of the first we were the third, I think the third credit in the nation to be certified and it wasn't a very difficult process, but we had to get our arms around what that really meant and what the account looked like and um, we also had enough information about what was going on in the marketplace. We found a lot of research in, in um, associations that we were, were talking through that Bank of America actually was the most successful bank on credit, uh, bank on bank in the country. And you know they draw millions of new members in a year and they're, they're, they use it as twofold, one for the un and under bank and then for students. And so to them, it wasn't just a one, a one kind of line strategy, it was a broader strategy because they also found out that most young folks don't really want checks, they want to have some way of moving payments around. And so for us, it was an easy, it was an easy decision. And um, we have just started to expand our marketing into the other part of it, which is the youth. But, you know, right now, it is the, it is the cornerstone of our low mind income and unbanked uh, strategy. We built simultaneously, we created something called the credit builder loan. And that very simply is we lent the money to the member to, we lent the money to the member and then put it into a savings account. So it was a secured loan and the member built credit. And that would then move if they did that and then did financial education with it, they would end up having a, a lower interest rate automobile loan. And simultaneously they had the bank on credit, uh, the bank on card to actually put in their paycheck. And so we started to combine multiple things to give them kind of a roadmap and now all of a sudden they have a discipline, they have a savings account and they build credit. Mm. So it's kind of a, it's a triple approach to it. And so it works really well. Now, distribution is a little hard when you're, you know, an airspace and, and a healthcare credit union for the most part. And so now we have obviously used our, our community standards to start partnering uh, with other, with not for nonprofits to deal with different populations in our communities that would need that would need that help in this you know and uh, we just eliminated even the four dollar fee that we had that which is allowable on bank on on the on the uh, easy card because we found in our research that bank of america who we always kind of look at as the um, unfortunately we have to look at as the as the cornerstone of the bank on program um, had eliminated their fee and so it wasn't really creating a lot of income and it was a little more resistance there so now it's an absolutely free discipline account. And the early results are that we do have folks that have graduate, not as much of the population as we'd like, but it's a learning experience. And for us, it was learning. What, is it, what do these folks look like? How do we approach them? And we found that our traditional branch system might be okay to bring in youth, but it's not necessarily the right place to bring in those that are unbanked and underserved. We've got to have a different channel. And so we're working on creating relationships with not only nonprofits, but with church groups, because a number of minority, a lot of the minority population will trust their church more than they would trust any not-for-profit. So, but it's a process. It's not a, you know, it's, it's not a switch to turn on and all of a sudden you're successful at it. It's a long-term process. And we are in the process now of, we have gotten a few CDFI grants to do certain things that helped in the community. During COVID, we got a grant to help with those folks that couldn't pay their back rent. Um, the, you know, the first the first grant we got was to create a, uh, an, in a a youth program, which included the credit easy card, the credit builder, and then the automobile loan. And um, the the grant we're working on now with the CDFI is to create a comprehensive program over the next five years, mm -hmm. specifically aimed at minority populations, and it includes everything from um, uh, first month, last month rent assistance to uh, uh, buy downs on the mortgage loan to a down payment assistance program to helping them get ready for work, having the services to let them do, you know, learn how to interview, to dress, all those other things. So we have a very comprehensive CDFI strategy, which is basically part of our product line. It's not something separate, 
all of the things we do, we'll do for anyone who walks in the door as well. So using it not as a, oh, it's over here and it's got a special little thing. Exactly. And so that's really where our strategy is today. And that's how we got into it. And, you know, the driver was, um, it's the right thing to do. Um, and we can go on like we are and we'd be fine or we can make a difference in our communities and really start to define who we are as a credit union in the eyes of that community. Man, that's, that's it. That's, you just share so much. It's so much for us to unpack there. Um, like you said, just kind of going away from business as usual and really, you know, defining yourself as a credit union that is of the community and for the community. Um, and you talked about so many different things and, you know, how it's helped you all expand your membership, but then also has, you know, taught you a lot of lessons around, you know, how to engage, especially newer members to the credit union. You talked a little bit about youth, about talking with, about community-based organizations that you guys have um, been able to recruit and, and bring members into the credit union as well. You know, can you, can you talk more about that? You also mentioned some of the financial literacy programs and you mentioned, um, you know, some credit builder loans and other products, you know, can you talk more about, you know, what, you know, either, you know, some lessons that you guys have learned and go deeper into some lessons you guys have learned as you come to understand, you know, and work more with the underserved population or, you know, also, you know, we don't really talk too much about the, uh, the, the negative side or what the downside is to bank on or, you know, some of the negative connotations you talked about, you know, how it hasn't necessarily panned out the way that you want it, you know, but what are some of those lessons learned that you've kind of come across um, as you've used it as a member engagement tool. All right, that's fair enough. So let me let me talk about it from a risk perspective first. One thing that we were afraid of in the beginning is that there's going to be a lot of risk and people are going to take advantage of it. We've had no losses in Easy Card. We have had no losses in Credit Builder. It's really hard to have a loss in either one of them since they're both kind of safe. Right. <laughs> and the folks that have gotten the, the alternative credit or the, the you know the very little credit automobile loans again. Because we become relevant with those other products, mm. they're not so. Easy. They'll make our payment before they won't make someone else's payment. And I think yeah. we we keep on forgetting that as a credit union industry. I've been left credit unions a very small one, a very big one, um, and then two of the similar size. And um, I think what's consistent in all of them is that when you do something special for the person, for the, mm. the person they they remember that you know if you go back to the origin go back to the origins of credit unions you know when we were the place where we actually uh lent out the money for the the linemen to actually buy their tools we oh, became yeah. relevant yeah. in their life you know over time that disappeared because you know the, the telephone companies and the and the boeing and the other companies started paying you know providing tools but in the right. beginning that's not how it was right so we've got to find a way to be relevant but the only way to be relevant is you know, did you have an impact on their life? And can you get away from what they're thinking to what they're feeling? Right. And to me, if you make them feel good about themselves and you help them, you know, help define success for them, you know, mm -hmm. in, the, in the case of our products, so you got a credit bill loan, they have no credit score or they have a bad credit score. So it could be a builder or a rebuilder. Now you help them get a credit score. That gives them more access to credit at more affordable prices. The card, as far as the uh, easy card, it allows them to manage their money without the temptation of overdraft. You know, as much as we like to talk about overdraft protection, in some cases, that's not a good thing. Right. It's no better than the check cashing companies. But at least in this case, they can't do anything with it. They get paid $1,000, they have $1,000. They don't have $1,000 plus whatever we allow them to do. So it provides a level of education through the products. Right. You start putting that together with regular education, you know, different topics. You know, one of the things I think we miss in our education is we tell them how to buy a car, but we don't educate them about what that means once you buy the car. Mm. We tell them how to buy a house, but we don't tell them how to, what happens after they buy the house. And so to me, the education has to be not just about getting the loan, which is what those products, those education usually is about. What happens after that? What do you need to know when you buy a car about insurance, about, you know, whatever it may be, you know, we teach them, we're not trying to sell you gap or, or mechanical breakdown, but let's give you the examples. You know, people who buy cars, especially used cars, are usually just at the end of their dollar amount. They don't have a lot of extra money. And the, the most constant reason for delinquency in automobiles is if they have a transmission fail or tire fail. Wow. And the difference is, do I make the payment or do I have the transportation to work fixed? Right. And you know, I've learned that for many years of many, many years of, of collections, just understanding what the major drivers are between delinquencies on that delinquency. So again, helping them understand what happens after you drive that car off the lot, or you buy it from your friend or whatever it is. What else do you need to know about it? So 
to me, we have all the products. It's just a matter of putting together the story that they understand mm. in a way that is not condescending, but just a way of here's what it looks like. Here's what the journey is like. And I think that's what these products all do. They're just products, but they enable us to tell a story and then give the member solutions on that pathway. Yeah, that's awesome. And it, it sounds like, you know, you guys are really looking at, you know, your consumer and as our, at new consumers, but potential new members holistically with their needs and meeting their needs where they are, as opposed to, you know, other uh, banking institutions that really take a predatory look at it and as, see them as a dollar sign. You guys are seeing them as more so oh, yeah. a community and that you guys are a part of that community as well. Um, yeah. And it's, not, you know, the arguments I've heard against it, because I now have been around doing this and I've been on other, you know, I've been on a lot of uh, uh, panels, a lot of the argument, well, it, you know, it's going to cost us money. Well, and not really. I think it's going to cost you some thought time maybe, but you're not going to take any losses. It's an, to me, it's an investment in the future. We're looking at it as a way of how do we build, we, we're, our, you know, our byline is building lifetime financial partnerships. Well, right. you know, you don't build it by giving them an automobile loan through a dealer. It doesn't, that's not a building a lifetime partnership. That's a loan and that's a pure investment. There's no relationship really there. But to us, it's, you know, can we build these relationships that have a stickiness to them? Because first there's the Remember I talked about mind and heart. There's yeah, a yeah. heart connection. When they feel something for you and they really believe that you're there to help them, you build trust. You build trust. You don't have to have the lowest rate in town as long as you're competitive. You don't have to have the highest deposit rate. You don't have, you, you know, you really shouldn't be fee-centric because that's just not a good thing to do. That's philosophically my, me talking here, but I'm not a fee guy. I think that fees are just interesting. Um, you know, a lot of the programs we're building with this grant are, are reward programs. You know, you make 12 months of your automobile payment and we'll pay you, we're going to give you 1% into your savings account back if you make the 12 payments on time. So what I do, instead of collecting, saying I'm going to charge you a late charge because you're late on the loan, right. I'm going to give you a benefit by not being late. Yeah. And so, again, reversing everything we've done. And a lot of these are not new ideas. I mean, there's a credit union that I know uh, that's you know, changed the way they've done that. And they've had a very high level of success. Again, loan payments, when people get difficult, get into difficulty, whether they make your loan payment or not is going to be how they feel about you, you know. Yeah. I think that's a, but I think that's a, a really good, you know, stick linchpin for the conversation, though, you know, taking that paradigm shift from punitive relationship with your members as fee based to that uh, positive reinforcement where it's like we want you to build this relationship, we want to incentivize you to build a good relationship and let's reward you for doing the things as opposed to penalize you for doing for doing for right. not doing the right things and especially when we talk about, you know, underbank and unbanked populations, a lot of that, you know, the research shows is it's a general mistrust of the financial system for various reasons right you know we talk about home lending we talk about auto lending we talk about predatory financial systems as check cashers and things like that. And when you think about, you know, the underserved community really having, you know, like you said, building that trust where they know that they can come somewhere and one, they're going to be taken care of. They're going to be seen as a, two, they're going to be seen as a whole person and three, that they aren't going to be penalized for their ignorance of how to use the situ, the how to leverage the system. Um, and so I think, you know, you say something really key in that paradigm shift. And I, you know, want to know how that you necessarily been received by the community. You guys are out in the community building these partnerships, but you know, would you like to talk more about how the community as a whole has kind of responded to you guys? You know, stepping out and wanting to build that bridge and building that trust. You know? I think I could, t I could best des describe it by some of the stories we've heard, and you know, that get told back to us. You know. It, it, again, this is a process. It's not something that just occurs. And it's only been going on for us for, I guess, three years now, four years. I've been there here almost four years, but it's been about three years since we've been real active in this. And the board has embraced it as well. Um, we're seeing that we're making a difference. We're, you know, mm -hmm. somebody who's been, uh, and I'm going to give you my, my favorite example is that I will tell you that if I go through um, my met current members, not even the reaching out members, and look at their credit profile and then look at what they're paying on an automobile ex else elsewhere right. what what's happening is their lack of confidence in the building in the in the banking system and their then lack of confidence in their own ability to repay because they start believing they can't even though they're making the payments we see people that we can you know we and it was an example a couple of months ago where someone was paying almost 19 percent on an automobile loan and they, they they qualify for our a credit that's where they were in a credit but you know they walked in the dealer and the dealer is very predatory there's four boxes 
You know, what do you want your monthly payment to be? Don't look at the fact that your interest rate is very high. And the, the less knowledgeable the person is, and the more they play up on the emotion of buying the car rather than the logic of the business situation, they get taken care advantage of. Now, that's only one example, though. A lot of people that do check cashing don't need to. Right. They would just have a little bit more discipline and, and someone would help them with that. So to me, I think there's a little, everyone thinks I think it's, you know, an enormous change for these folks to actually come into the regular banking system. And it really isn't. It's just about giving them the tools, the comfort that you're going to, you're out there to help them, not to screw them excuse me for the word, but I can't think of another word. And, um, you know, that you're really there for their benefit and not for some financial gain. And once they, once you build that trust, they won't go to those systems again. They'll come to you if they're in a, in a problem and say, look, I'm having a problem. And that's when you do your emergency loan. You do with those, we have all those products in place now. You know, we have an emergency loan when someone gets in trouble. You know, you know something happened, the person lost their job. And they went, you know, not giving them the money to pay for the tires on the car to get to work serves no purpose. The loan's going to go delinquent anyway. Right. <laughs> they can't get to work and they can't get paid. So we have to use a little more logic in the interaction. But that when you build that into your, into your culture, people start looking for what's the best thing for that member? What's the best set of solutions? Sometimes it's tough luck. No, you don't need that you know, $70,000 car. You need dependable transportation to work. You have to have adult conversations with the folks. You can't be parental. You need to be adult. The other thing is you need to treat people with respect. And I think that's the one thing that we've spending a lot of time on. I don't care whether you're, you know, coming in a suit or you come in and, you know, worn jeans and a t-shirt because you just came from, the, you know, working on a, on a construction site. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah. And I think when you get rid of those differences, you know, whether it's that difference or the, you know, race difference or the age difference or the, right. uh, you know, whatever, whatever differences we may have, when you see everybody the same, I think that's really good. You know, I, my, this is a personal story, but when I was growing up, my parents had friends, okay, when I was a kid. So they had African-American friends, they had Jewish friends, they had Irish friends, they had gay friends, they had Asian friends. So I only thought of them as friends. I never really looked at the differential until I went to school. So then I was learned, I learned all the differentials and it was kind of like, I don't understand it. You know, they're, they're just friends. And that, I think that's the problem we have is that we don't, when, Unfortunately, and as I'm kind of, I'm a blunt guy. So the bluntness is, I guarantee when someone walks into the branch, someone makes it, it makes a, 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 a uh, some sort of assessment in their mind, whether they do it intentionally or not. Right. You know, I'll give a personal story. So it's something to do with my banking, but this is a personal story about prejudice. Many years ago, I worked in a credit unit in the South Florida area, and there was no great store. So I was in a conference in San Francisco. And I walked into Nordstrom's with a pair of jeans and a t-shirt on because it was a warm day and that's all I had. I mean, you know, and I had shoes on or whatever else, not, not a scruffy kind of guy to begin with. And all of the male salesmen in the room made, a, made an assessment. He's in the men's shop buying suits, probably can't afford them. So new sales lady came out, she introduced herself and I walked out, I had spent $6,000 and it was her first day. You know what? I said, lesson learned, don't get prejudiced, you know? And you know, that's because of the way I was dressed, not even because of my color or anything else. It was the way I was dressed. So people have inherent prejudice and they make, make decisions. Um, but that's an important part of this because I don't think you can reach out to folks that are different than, than you are unless you have a lot of comfort that your, your, that your team is blind to those things. Yeah. Understands them because you have to understand the differences. You know? yep. Yep. But it's, we're spending a lot of time and energy and this is part of the back story behind everything we're doing in, the, in, our, in our outreach about you know, diversity and equity and inclusion, but not just from an internal employment perspective, but how we deal with it in the broader sense. Yeah. So it's not just a buzzword for us. It's, it's part of what we do and trying to help our, our team understand that everyone is different, but we treat them the same and understand their differences. So um, that's, that was almost pontificating. I didn't mean to do that. But the, the point is you can't be successful at rolling out an easy card or a credit builder or anything else to the unbanked and underbanked uh, populations unless you really understand them and open to having them come in the, the office. Definitely. I think that's a great point that you make. And I think we, you know, we talked about, you know, what, what, why, why the business case, right? We talked about how it's profitable. We talked about mitigating the risk, but you know, that last piece when we, and just the broader conversation around underbanked and unbanked folks is, you know, there are a lot of unconscious bias that, you know, we as institutions, as professionals, you know, have to unpack and be willing to address and deal with 
um, and set aside such that we can get back true to what you said, you know, is the, is the credit union mission, you know, people helping people and, and being, you know, staples of a community that are willing to extend the hand and create that bridge between folks who generally have no trust of the financial system that have been preyed on and, you know, have been uh, continued to be victim to predatory practices and really show them that, you know, coming to a credit union is, is really the difference. And, you know, I think that this bank on, you know, you guys have shown, you've been a part of the bank on, uh, at one of the first credit unions to be bank on certified, to offer bank on certified account, you know, continuing in the last four years since you're joining, you know, to expand that program. I think you guys are uh, a great, um, a great institution to really just kind of show uh, and set an example and, and provide that insight around it can work because if a, a large credit union like you all can turn your turn yourselves intentionally towards the winds of change, then there's no reason anyone else can. Um, I think I think having said all I said, I don't think I could have been successful bringing our team together if it wasn't that Nader, Magadam, and the board are totally behind it. You can't do it in a division or department somewhere separate from the rest of the organization. So you go do your thing, but just don't really bother us. It's gotta be, it's gotta have a, you know, you've gotta have a tone of the top is a big issue here. And the, you know, the board is hundred percent supportive. Nader has been very supportive about it and, and very vocal about it. And, you know, for credit union that's an aerospace and healthcare, this is a little foreign if you think about it, but yet we've embraced it as understanding that's how you become successful in the long run. And if you look at the really successful credit unions that haven't done it through other kinds of things, they've stuck to who they are and really had a big reach out to people in their communities. And gosh, gosh Joe, I wish we had like so much more time because you're speaking my language here, talking about the soul of people, talking about, you know, community development as a full strategy, talking about those things. I think we're going to have to bring you back, you know, for a part two so you can tell us more about that because, you know, that's, that's, I think that that is even the bigger piece, right? It's not just about one one product is not just about one community based partnership is not just about one organization uh just you know one set of customers or member engagement right it's really about you know that full that full strategy um but you know we're running out of time here so we're gonna wrap it up but with that being said you know are there any final thoughts that you want uh to leave with any of our members or other credit unions who may be considering or on the brink of deciding whether or not to take this route of offering a bank on product or anything like that. Is there, do you have any last thoughts that you want to leave? Yeah, I do. So my, my very, my, I think in a very succinct way, um, I think the biggest risk that you face by not embracing the strategy is that you are not going to become relevant. And very honestly, you'll become an irrelevant unless you can compete with the big banks as a bank, you're not, you're not going to compete as a credit union in the future. Credit unions are going to have to make a difference. And to me, these are just, these are almost table stakes having these kind of products and outreach. They're not even something really, you know, we haven't gotten to the cool stuff yet. And, you know, this is, this is to me, just the way you have to set the foundation. Man. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much uh, for your insight. I think, you know, a lot of things that you said are essential to, you know, what's on the minds of our members who are looking to make this change, who are looking to implement something, uh, whether that be creating something new or like what you guys did, just shifting a product that they already had and gearing it towards uh, where uh, to the bank on standard. So Joe, thank you. We'll wrap up here. I want to thank you for your time. Um, and thank you for joining us today and sharing your insights. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Appreciate you too. Thanks. Definitely.